All right, here we go. We're back with part two of my conversation with Rico Bertoletti of Rico's Repair Service. Let's get to it. So these these are all folks that you've known before, or were any of these people like that you placed an ad, interviewed them, and or they were all connections of yours beforehand? Uh, Jason, my lead mechanic, was somebody that I went through high school with, so I knew him, and it was kind of a cool story. He needed a lawnmower, and I had one. He couldn't afford it, so I said, hey, Jason, tell you what, take the lawnmower. You come in here, and you help me out on the weekends. I'm getting buried here, you know, and you'll pay it off over, you know, uh, I, we didn't really set uh, how many weekends he had to work for me, so we started coming down to the shop every Saturday. And uh, then I told him at one point, hey, the lawnmower's paid off. You don't have to come in no more. And he continued to come in. Um, so now I have to, <laughs> now, now, gotta I gotta, yeah, now I got to pay him. <laughs> if you're going to keep coming in, I'm going to have to pay him. Uh, so he continued to come in and then he had lost his job. He was in the gun business, uh, worked at gun stores all his life and they fired him. And I said, well, hey, uh, you know, I, I have like 40 machines that need to be done. So why don't we just jump into this? And I think I started Jason at $10 an hour. Um, I don't want to say what he's currently at, but he's uh, very well paid. He's not making $10 an hour anymore. And um, th that's how I met th that. He's been with me the longest. Uh, my next employee, again, was a goodwill thing. Jen, who's currently my manager. She used to work at the gas station down the road from us, and the he had sold the gas station. So I knew the fellow that sold the gas station. His name was Wook, and uh, he came in with uh, Jen and told me, yep, I'm out. I sold the gas station, and I said, well, Jen, what are you doing for work as the phone keeps ringing? And uh, she said, well, you know, I'm out of work. I said, well, why don't you come in a, a day or two a week, and uh, I, I've got a lot of things that I need to catch up on, I could use some help. Well, she turned out to be like the shining light. Um, she's absolutely taken over this place. She's the face of my business now. And I believe she also started at $10 an hour. And again, I won't say what she's making now, but she's uh, able to make a, a very good living for herself. So tell me, Rico, how, do, how does that make you feel as an owner of a business, knowing that there are people who are essentially depending on that business, your business for their livelihood. That gets scary. That's very scary. We're a seasonal business and now my payroll is $3,500 a week. Uh, that's scary because without work, um, they, you know, I have to start laying people off and it will be in the order that, you know, that they were brought on board. Um, so that's always scary because I know I have, you know, um, I, I know Jen has two children. I know Josio, another one of my mechanics, has two children. And so I, I know there's a lot riding on the business to be successful. And there's a lot of children riding on this business to be successful. I'm, I'm not where I want to be, but I do have a comfort zone in how much money is in the bank because I know I can continue to provide them with uh, a salary, whether money is coming in this building or not. Uh, it wouldn't be for very long, but uh, I, I do have enough to at least keep them going for, you know, uh, maybe two or three weeks, about a month. Uh, that's the way I've planned things. I've been very lucky through COVID-19 that my business has benefited from it. Um, but should, uh, should it have affected us, we were a restaurant or a gym or one of the other businesses that had to quit operating, uh, I would have about 30 days and everybody would have to fend for themselves. And then I feel like at that point, trying to get the employees back would be almost impossible. So, you know, outside of the challenge, obviously in the, you, you mentioned it's, it's scary knowing that those folks are, are depending on you for their livelihood. It's, it's still probably got to make you feel good that you're able to, to help folks out because there were the, the two stories that you shared were of people who didn't have any, any uh, income, didn't have a job, but you were able to provide that for them. So that, that's, that's got to make you feel good too. 
It does. I it, There's a wash between make you feel good and worried about keeping them with work. Um, owning your own business is, uh, I wouldn't say extremely stressful, but there is a lot on your plate. I, I should, one day I will take the time to sit back and say, wow, look what I built. But that time just <laughs> never seems to come. It, it <laughs> I, I, I worry about how do they get paid tomorrow? How, how do I move this forward? How do I get everybody that works for me to make more money? Um, me personally, I don't pull a salary out of this business. I pay my, I, I just take what I need to pay my personal bills and I don't do extravagant vacations. I don't, I reinvest. I bought a forklift. I bought a lift. I, I just constantly reinvest back into the business. So I'm not pulling a lot out of it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I, I've i never had that moment where I step back and say, wow, what the, this is great. Look at all these people in play. I, I'm still struggling with the moment of, oh my God, if no work comes in, what do we do? Well, I, I don't think that's... Uh uncommon for for folks who start businesses like like you have there there's that fine line between standing back and admiring what you have and also worrying about keeping what you have so yeah, time I believe, uh, I believe a lot of that may came may come from my background I've worked for somebody else all my life I look at everything from the employee perspective because essentially that's what I've done all my life I wasn't given a business. I didn't earn, start a business at a young age. I, you know, 44 years old before I came into owning my own business and being that I've worked for, now that gives me a, 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 an advantage nobody else will have also that I know how to treat people because I have been the employee all my life. Now all of a sudden I'm the boss and, uh, but knowing how to treat people um, is huge. I, I'm a hundred percent employee retention. Um, I've had to fire two people so far. Uh, but other than that, how, how was that? Was, well, that wasn't fun. Was it? No, it sure was not. The first time I had to fire somebody, uh, I'm a very passive person and I did not want to do it. Um, but it's what had to be done. And I had thought about it for uh, over many drinks and two, three days in a row. And I had, planned it all out, what I was going to tell them, how I was going to fire them. And uh, none of that actually happened. I came in and told them why he had to get the hell out of my shop. And uh, that was a, a, about the end of it. It was stressful, the first person I fired. The second person got a little bit better, but I still do not. I will never like firing somebody. Uh, but sometimes in business, you do what you have to do. Well, it's, it's not real, I guess, as a boss until you have to actually fire somebody. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that, a lot of that, uh, the, the first person I fired came from the reason that he was fired is because I didn't know what his background was until we got into a payroll service and the payroll service actually, you know, we were cash business in the beginning and the payroll service actually reached back out to me and told me who was working for me. And that's why I had to let him go. Um, so that was like, wow, an eye opener to really run a background check on people before they start working sure. for you. So, uh, you know, from that unpleasantness to the current unpleasantness, you touched on the, the COVID-19 and, you know, how it's affecting like the, the, uh, service businesses like restaurants and, and gyms, you know, my gym has been closed. So I've been managing uh, workouts here with my son and my daughter, just inventing stuff to do. But how, how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your business if, if it's affected it at all? Well, I, it's very difficult to say being a new business, um, I know there will always be growth when you start a business. Um, and I don't know if the growth that I'm seeing is because of COVID-19 or if it's because I'm establishing my business. Uh, the COVID-19, we're in the outdoor power equipment industry and people are now, they're home and they want to take care of their own house. And to take care of their own house, they now need a lawnmower and a weed whacker and a rototiller. Um, so sales have gone absolutely through the roof. 
but I don't know if those sales are coming from uh, the fact that people are now home needing equipment to care for their own houses, or if the sales have just simply come from me coming into my second year with a dealership, my name getting out there, the advertising starting to take. So that'll be a very difficult decision when I go to make my preseason order for next year, because I have to figure out was my growth from COVID-19 being in this business or was my growth uh, simply because my name is getting out there and the, and the business is growing. Yeah, forecasting is, is uh, it's tough. You work at it and you don't always get it right. You know, stuff that happens in the past doesn't always repeat itself in the future. The skill you have in that is, is probably going to be something that develops over time. It's going to be tough to nail it down exactly, but it's probably a, a combination of both those things that you were mentioning. But, yeah, and it uh, goes, you know, as, as we go back through this, uh, the interview I think was really good to me because I now have a thought in my head about starting out of the garage in my house, the risk I took to, uh, to get a shop and to quit my job uh, versus now I have to take more risks because I don't have solid numbers going into next year, how big of a preseason order I place. Um, kind of thinking back to the way I started this business, I'm, I'm going to have to take a gamble and go a little bit bigger than I think I need. And you know, it's interesting you say that because a lot of people want to pull back the reins and not spend because of the uncertainty of the economy due to the, the uh, coronavirus. And historically, though, the businesses that spend, you know, you got to be smart about it, but are willing to continually invest in their businesses and invest in your education, whatever it is, when this is over, and it's just a season, it will be over one day, you'll be ahead of the game over the folks who kind of cowered and, and waited. Yes. Yep. Uh, definitely. The name of it, it, as far as sales go, sales are, uh, we don't get a big profit margin on sales. That's not what drives the business. It's the service. Um, but as far as taking a risk goes, yes. If I'm, if I'm willing to take a big risk in overstock on inventory, potentially overstock on inventory, the next person that didn't, um, my sales will go up and theirs will go down. So risk reward is always part of, I think, any business. Sure. So, so let's, let's go into a little, little more detail about what you do. I know some of the things that you repair, obviously lawnmowers and, you know, small engines. What, what won't you do? I mean, how, I know you do a large, uh, uh, landscape companies and people who do lawn services who have big machines, but what, what are some of the things that you just kind of don't do or maybe well, we, we, get we, tr we try to stay away from large machines. Um, we're not a bit, a very big facility and large machines, although they have the, we have a set labor rate and I'm not going to charge you any different if you brought a caterpillar in here or a front end loader in here to repair it than it would if you brought your residential lawnmower in here. The only difference will be that your Caterpillar will take me six times longer to get parts for. It will occupy 10 times more space than residential lawnmowers. So we're not equipped. Uh, I do not want the large machines, although I can repair them. Um, they're, it's not something that I want here and I want to have to store. So the largest machine, and the, I, we do work on the front end loaders for District 227. They have some large machines. And the only reason that I'm willing to work on and repair those is that I simply won't let them go to another dealer. Uh, they, when something breaks, I want them calling me. I don't want to defer them to, oh, uh, call this guy or that guy. That Those bigger commercial at school accounts, you have to be the everything guy. So for those customers, we'll take the larger machines in. Um, but for the average person, a large, like a, uh, a 2,000 pound, 72 inch deck uh, lawn cutting machine is about as big as we're gonna get. 
So now if you have uh, districts or, or school districts, park districts, big entities like that, is, is that a, is that a big chunk of your business? Are you, are you actively going after that? Um, I would love to get more townships, more, uh, more park uh, park districts municipalities uh would it, it's a steadier business because obviously um, they they have bigger equipment because they're covering more land yeah they have bigger equipment it's better maintained they'll follow the our fleet management program that we run um for example uh, uh 227 i had mentioned them earlier um that's a school district that bought three very large machines from me and school districts do not lack maintenance. They want everything taken care of and they want to get the best out of their equipment. So we run a program with them where we stock them with all the parts that they need for their machine. And we, we will come by once a month to check on the inventory. Whatever inventory they've used, we bill them for. But their maintenance has the ability to repair their machines because we've provided them with parts for it obviously those folks are probably a little easier to deal with than the average Joe coming in with his lawnmower. So what are, for the folks like me who, you know, have lawnmowers, snowblowers, what are some mistakes those people make uh, taking the, care of their stuff? The, the, the biggest 90, 80% of our business comes from people leaving gas in their machines um, as a matter of fact, Cecil, that's why your generator is in my shop right now. If you left, uh, that's yes, correct. But, um, so you're not alone in that. Repairing that is very profitable for us. Although we give you the education and we give all our customers the education on how to prevent that from happening, it's always going to be part of the business. Leaving fuel inside of a machine is the majority of uh, smaller repairs. Sure, we sure. Uh, we're talking about the districts and the larger places that are are bringing you relatively well maintained things the the part of your business that's individuals bringing in machines that aren't as well maintained is is probably a a challenge for for you but again it's business and that's probably like you said a, a, the the bulk of your business yeah you you have two groups of people um, the first group of people, which would be like A-list customers, they're going to have their machines maintained every year. And a machine that should have an average life expectancy of, say, five to seven years now goes to 15 to 20 years. So they're not, their equipment doesn't fail through the season when they need it. Um, they don't have to purchase new equipment because they're having it maintained every year. Uh, the second group brings it in when it's broke. And uh, they bring it in, and, it, and equipment breaks during the busy season. Um, they bring it in, and it needs to be repaired, and uh, that's the, really the bulk of our business. Majority of it is from gas. Um, that's early in the season. And then later in the year, you have people that, uh, you know, just make mistakes with the machinery, and um, they need to, or belts break, wear and tire items. If you don't do the preventative maintenance on a machine, there's a really good chance that I'll see you during the year when it breaks. Mm -hmm. If you do the preventative maintenance, you don't have the downtime or the failure rate. I have uh, five landscapers that I deal with, and although they don't always have the funds available to do all the preventative maintenance, um, if they don't do it, they will experience downtime through the year. If they do do the preventative maintenance, they'll have a smooth, easy sailing gear. Okay, sure. Makes sense. So with, with all that you have going on, obviously, I'm sure you're pouring a lot of hours into the business. How are you balancing your time with your personal kickback, relaxed time, family time? How, how, is, how is that going? Uh, my, my children are a little older now. I get one day off Sunday. Um, the rest of my time, I don't really have time off. When I'm home, uh, I, I don't relax. I think about the business, how to improve <laughs> it, I, what I can do the next day. Uh, I, I do try to set aside watching football, but all the other sports are gone. There's no time to enjoy. Uh, if there's no, I don't watch TV anymore. I don't read the newspapers. I don't 
I focus on marketing. I focus on what's going on in the business. So uh, there's not a lot of time off mentally, like physically, I'm not at this location, but mentally I am still here. Uh, Sunday, I do my best to just turn my phone off, absolutely forget what happened during the week and do nothing. Um, but that doesn't always happen. So there, there's really not a balance. I think once you, once you start running a business, your mind's always going to be on it. There's, there's just simply no turning it off. And well, it, it's tough. I, I know uh, personally, and I, you know, I've talked to a lot of other people. It's, 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 a, it's quite a challenge. Like you said, you may physically not be there, but mentally you are always thinking about it. Yeah, and, and if you're willing to mentally turn off and to walk away from your business, I, I don't know how much success you're going to have. Um, I think a lot of my success comes from 24-7, the business being on my mind. And uh, I, I come into work the next morning with uh, seven people working for me in a new set of decisions. And this is how we're going to do this better today. This is what we're going to change about what we did yesterday. So if you're not willing to make, you know, put the time in, um, I don't know in my particular business how successful you'd be. Sure. Well, hopefully as time goes by and you grow that you'll, you'll be able to do like, like we discussed earlier, a little uh, standing back and admiring what you built. <laughs> to a certain yeah, extent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe one day. I do get that in the slower seasons, and I've got a great man manager, Jen. Um, I can, if I wanted to, I could walk away from this for a week, and she could just run everything. Um, but I don't want to, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm still <Understood>. here. <laughs> so the, so the ability to do it's there. I just don't do it. So, so as we uh, close out here, and uh, definitely appreciate you, man obviously everybody has competitors. What is the one thing or a couple things that, that really separates Rico's repair service from other places that do what you do? A uh, quality. Um, it being very important to me, the employees, everybody, we, we have some things in place that, uh, you know, um, you're going to lose a couple of bucks if you do not repair things correctly. Uh, but quality being job one, uh, when you bring even an average lawnmower into us, it gets checked two times and tested before it leaves to go back to the customer. We've had a great year this year. I think we've had three or four machines. I believe we've done over 1,800 machines this year, and three or four of them were not repaired correctly throughout the year. So quality is why people come here and deal with me. We have people that come from uh, a couple people from Michigan. Uh, a lot of the neighboring and surrounding towns and they come here because they want it fixed right the first time. So if quality is job one and the process is in place to ensure that that quality is there, uh, I believe that's what makes the, the business continue to grow. Well, awesome, man. Uh, anything else folks should know about, about you personally or the business, anything? Uh, just the, uh, a side note of, I believe if you're good to people, if you treat people fair and you're honest in your business, I believe it's going to grow. We, we may all dip into that point where we're not very profitable and we're not making a lot of money and there's a cheaper way that you can do things. If you take that road, you're probably not going to have success. Uh, but if you continue to treat people right, be very honest and very fair cheating nobody out of anything and explaining it, I believe you'll have success. Good words to live by, man. Well, I want to thank Rico Bertoletti for being the first guest on Cecil's Unknown Achievers. Uh, this was the very first podcast I've ever done, and you are the first guest. So I appreciate you. And I wasn't just blowing smoke earlier, man. I, I do admire you and I uh, thankful that I got to see your growth from when you started out to where you are now. And I know uh, big things are, are still coming for you. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you be uh, me being the first interview for you too. Absolutely. I think that's really cool. And uh, best of luck to you too, Cecil with, uh, I know you're also in several different directions, but uh, I hope the, uh, the voiceover, and the things that you're doing now, you're successful. And I believe you will be because you're a good person. You're a good trusting person that somebody can deal with. 
And uh, I, I believe when you put that good karma out like you are, um, you're going to have good success. Hey, and the same to you, man. Thank you very much, Rico. I'll let you let you get out of here and uh, get out of the office and, and get home. All right. Thanks, Cecil. Good talking to you. All right, Rico. Take care, buddy. Thank you. Bye. All right. That's it. Cecil's Unknown Achievers. Episode one is a wrap. My thanks to Rico Bertoletti for spending the time. If you want to reach out to Rico's Repair Service, you can visit their website at ricosrepairservice.com. That's R-I-C-C-O-S, repairservice.com. Or give them a call at 708-248-6354. Until next time, this is Cecil Archbold Jr. with Cecil's Unknown Achievers.